also what's been shown here is with CYP2C9, one also sees a uh, significant association with this, but again, we're needing more numbers and these are being collected uh, uh, as we speak. Also, when you look at Captain Meyer curves, in fact, uh, the curve of time to INR greater than the four by genotype, again, what you can see here uh, is that these are, uh, the AA genotype has a much lower uh, proportion of patients essentially getting there, uh, and this represents because they are very, very sensitive. So these uh, are patients, again, showing the data. Uh, the the VCORC1 has a significant effect uh, uh, on this, and, uh, and these carriers, uh, given the appropriate, uh, uh, if you have an AA genotype and you're really going to treat the patient with the appropriate uh, dose that would be given just normally, these are children highly likely to have serious side effects associated with it. So we believe right now that we have validated this testing for warfarin dosing in children. Uh, we believe that predictive genotyping will provide further refinement of appropriate warfarin therapy for children who are already desperately ill. And certainly, uh, this is likely to uh, provide information uh, for children who are likely to experience over or under coagulation with warfarin therapy. Now, let me just move to one final issue. Uh, I was born in South Africa and always interested to see uh, the impact uh, of some of these variations and the impact of pharmacogenomics, particularly in the developing world, where uh, if the child goes deaf or goes into heart failure, many times these are prescriptions for, for death. A child who's deaf, there are no resources, and there are no cochlear transplants, there are no hearing aids that could help those particular children. And so the question is, how would pharmacogenomics have impact in, in other milieus? So we have also set up now uh, uh, looking, and in particular, as we think about the drugs of uh, cisplatin and anthracyclines, which are the most commonly used drug for children with cancer throughout the continent of Africa. And what you can see here is cancer is becoming now uh, the mating, uh, a, a major uh, a global health problem, and particularly also in the African continent, it's actually increasing in frequency here. And what you can see here in developing countries, this is going up at a much greater rate uh, than in the, develop, in the industrialized countries. So 70% of new cancer cases are going to be in the developing countries, and the first line of therapy will be anthracyclines and cisplatin. Well, what's the relevance of this to this particular population? Of course, these African pop populations show the greatest amount of genetic diversity. There is very little pharmacogenetic data, uh, and limited resources make some of these si uh, side effects and adverse events particularly worrisome. So we have now collected, an, as part of an African pharmacogenomic diversity project, uh, we have collected samples from throughout different regions of Africa, different populations, and these are increasing uh, from different regions and collaborators. And this is just part of a pilot project now, the initial report that uh, uh, is just submitted, uh, where we've looked from this diversity panel. Uh, we've got a group of controls. We've genotyped some of these genes and really just looking for the frequency associated with this. Our populations are broadly uh, uh, based from throughout different regions of Africa. And just for example, in uh, cisplatin, if you look at the frequency of this allele in the European population, this is around 6%. What you can see, the most significant TPMT variant is present in close to 50% of Africans. Uh, and, and if this was correct, we already know uh, that there's data uh, uh, the, from other studies that African patients of American origin, for example, have a much higher rate of cisplatin toxicity. And we also know that uh, they have much lower maximum tolerable dose associated with this. And so this would suggest that the risk of going deaf uh, in the African population, particularly those who have this allele, that likely is, is, is in fact much greater. And so also with cardiotoxicity, there's a two to threefold increased risk of anthracycline-induced uh, cardiotoxicity, assuming that these variants are also associated with uh, uh, this toxicity in these populations. And here you can see 2.5 to 12 and 1 to 18 percent, again, a significant increase. Again, this raises the issues that uh, this may be even more important to do screening in some of these populations 
and stratifying appropriately in an effort to prevent some of these side effects. So these are the two most commonly used cancer chemotherapies. Um, and certainly, uh, the no this knowledge may be very important as part of generalized screening to prevent disability in those communities uh, with significantly less resources. Now, let me just mention cost effectiveness. As we're trying to get this into the community as part of the Canadian healthcare system, you would look at this and you would say, this should be relatively simple. If we can't do it with cisplatin, uh, uh, then we're going to have really difficulty with other variants uh, where this is even uh, less dramatic in terms of the association. Well, to do this, we have to show both that it's possible to do this. We've got an educated uh, 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 personnel who are able to deliver it. But what about just cost-benefit? And we've done now some of these studies. So cisplatin, we now know this is just the economic cost for cisplatin just recently published in Pharmacogenomics, uh, and this is just showing for every patient. This is just looking at the lifetime healthcare cost. This is none of the psychological costs, no impact on learning, just the costs of medical care associated with this. If you look at those particular costs, uh, you could see that this would be about 20 million. This is including the cost for testing, which would be costed at a uh, rather expensive, 100 to $200 a test. Uh, this would save in Canada, 20 million a year. This is unrelated to the loss of human potential, the loss of the changes in behavior, psychological support, the impact and suffering on the family. You could multiply that by 10 for the United States, maybe 200 million a year in that particular instance. So we're looking at costs that are significant, uh, and we're hoping to be able to make the transition from these fundamental discoveries that are uh, really so important to which belong to uh, uh, the Canadian population, here they've been made, they're able to then also be extrapolatable to other populations. And this represents uh, what has been such a unique privilege uh, around creating this particular network and establishing it together with Bruce and other really important colleagues across the country who have played such an important role, in particular Colin Ross, who's been running the genomics lab associated with this. But this really covers the country uh, there's a whole training program in pharmacogenomics that's part of it, and we're hoping that as a result of this work, supported by Genome Canada and Genome BC, that Canada can become a leading force in the area of pharmacogenomics and also the translation of this in the interests of patients uh, uh, here and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We have time for some questions. Maybe I'll start with the first one. I assume that in the uh, cardiotoxicity study that these were all leukemia patients, the, the children? No, they were uh, mostly, but not all. Um, they, were quite, they weren't chosen by virtue of the cancer, although we have stratified these patients by cancer, uh, and there's no obvious difference. So it's not related to the type of, the type of cancer is not an independent variable variable that's okay. influencing the likelihood of the adverse event. Okay. At, at, uh, at some time in the past, they found that female sex was an independent risk factor. Did you see any such Which associations with, with, dox with, the, with anthracycline uh, cardiotoxicity? Sorry, I didn't hear the... Female sex, being a woman, a girl. Yeah. There was a slight uh, increased frequency uh, of female children, but this was not significant. Please. I guess it's on now. Uh, about the first one, anthracycline and cardiotoxicity, um, is there correlation with efficacy? In other words, you're just tuning in the effective drug, and you, if you halved it, uh, you still have you know, no cardiac toxicity, but same efficacy. And is the advantage of then of doing what you're suggesting, which of course is being suggested here, is determining that early before you get clinical cardiotoxicity? Well, there are some dose-related effects. So certainly some of these side effects are uh, 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 more prevalent in higher dose. We can correct for that. Uh, but, and sometimes, uh, and of course, dose may be related to increased efficacy. So um, we're looking at that, uh, but it's a, uh, so there is some relationship between dose uh, uh, and efficacy. Uh, and the side effect, but uh, it's all related to the higher dose associated with that. 
Any further questions? If not, thank you very much, Michael.